I'm ready on my end. Uh, looks like Ray's ready. Sarah Heller, if you all are ready in the council chambers, I think we can get started. Okay, uh, let me know when the recording is started. Oh, it has, okay. All right, I'll get my gavel out, make it official. And good afternoon. I'm gonna go ahead and call this session of the City of Oak Harbor Hearing Examiner to order. For the record, today is Thursday, September 29th, 2022 uh, at 1 p.m. We have one item on the agenda this afternoon. This is number 2201-0006, involving a request for approval of a preliminary plat to subdivide what ultimately would be a 4.95 acre site into 58 residential units uh, located in 17 multi-unit buildings as a planned residential development or PRD, along with associated site improvements and appurtenances at 1215 Southwest Swantown Avenue. My name is Andrew Reeves. I'm a hearing examiner with Sound Law Center who the city has selected to hold certain land use application hearings like this one. And today it will be my role to collect evidence in the form of exhibits and testimony to determine whether this proposal is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan, zoning ordinances, critical areas ordinances, and the specific criteria for approval of a preliminary plat under section 212070, I believe, of the municipal code, as well as the requirements for a PRD or planned residential development under section 1931-170 of the municipal code. And because this would involve the subdivision of land, ensure that the proposal complies with our state sub subdivision act, which is in chapter 5817 of the revised code of Washington. Uh, to that end, I received uh, several exhibits. I had an opportunity to review in advance of the hearing. Uh, and these include information, sort of the application materials themselves and, and all the reports, which were sort of lumped in as one exhibit. Uh, as well as the staff report prepared by city staff. But in terms of what has been designated as I think exhibit two, that included uh, various project plans, the landscape plans, uh, the critical areas identification form showing that there are no critical areas on site, uh, various memoranda that were prepared back and forth between uh, the applicant and uh, planning staff evaluating the proposal. Uh, site plan review narrative, uh, the SEPA checklist prepared under our state's Environmental Policy Act, uh, including the DNS or Determination of Non-Significance that was issued by the city uh, on uh, August 31st of this year. Uh, additional information related to that, including a SEPA memorandum that staff had prepared. Uh, information on how stormwater, preliminary stormwater plans uh, on how stormwater would be addressed on site. More application information and technical reports, including a geotechnical report, and then a traffic impact analysis prepared by Gibson Traffic. Uh, so I think those are the, the basics. And then as well as the uh, notice materials that were provided in relation to the application as well as today's hearing. So I'll go ahead and admit those exhibits into the record. Should anyone have additional uh, exhibits they would like admitted, let me know when it's your opportunity to testify and we'll go ahead and address admitting additional exhibits at that time. Uh, I may ask questions of those that are testifying. I'm not trying to trip anyone up. I'm just trying to ensure I have a thorough understanding of the proposal so that uh, within a couple of weeks of the record closing, I'm able to produce a decision that is hopefully clear and legally defensible. Uh, let's see, finally, the order that we typically follow and I believe we're gonna follow today is uh, first we'll hear from city staff who will give sort of an overview of the proposal and the review process that led us to today. After that, we'll turn to the applicant team, as it were, to present any additional information. Sorry, any additional information they feel that myself and members of the public should be aware of in advance of my making a decision on the proposal. Uh, then we'll see if there are members of the public interested in testifying either in person at the council chambers or uh, virtually, and when we get to that point in the hearing, we'll check in and attempt to determine if there are folks interested in, in participating, and if so, they'll have that opportunity. And then at the end, uh, if appropriate and necessary, we'll turn back to the applicant, applicant team and staff, uh, city staff to respond to any such testimony. Uh, for those that have joined virtually, if you're part of the sort of applicant team, if you can somehow indicate that if it's not too late to do so with your name, that's always helpful. 
um, but just so we have a sense of uh, who's a member of the public, who's part of the applicant team, that would be helpful. But generally, folks will remain uh, muted uh, until uh, asked to speak. And even if we were all in the room together, I would make every effort to ensure that uh, only one person is talking at a time uh, and that uh, the experience would not be too different between virtual or not. So those are the basics. I thank everyone for being here. And with that, we'll go ahead and I think get uh, Ray Lindenberg sworn in, I believe, who is presenting on behalf of the city. Is that right? That is correct. Okay, I'll swear you in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in the testimony you give here today? I do. And if you could just state and spell your name for the audio recording and explain your role here at the city. Sure. My name is Ray Lindenberg, L-I-N-D-E-N-B-U-R-G. I'm the senior planner for the city of Oak Harbor and the project manager for this uh, particular project. Great. Thank you, Mr. Lindenberg. So did my assessment of the exhibits sort of track with what you were hoping I would review in advance of the hearing? Yes, very thorough. You've, you've taken a lot of the sales out of my presentation here, so I appreciate that. <laughs> no problem. But as you know, I may ask questions, uh, and I'm not sure you believed when I said I'm not trying to trip anyone up. I got a grin. I noticed that. But uh, just making sure, obviously, I have all the information, and, and so I think you know that. But uh, with that, I'll let you dive in uh, with your presentation. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll keep it pretty short. You did uh, do a very good job of kind of outlining what it is we're doing here. Uh, the project is 58 residential units on a, an, a site that's going to end up being about 4.95 acres after a pretty significant road dedication that cuts through the middle of that property. Um, I know that the uh, applicant went through a lot uh, to try and get all of these uh, buildings and streets and parking areas and landscaping to fit into that site because it is kind of an odd shaped site. So uh, staff and the applicant team work together significantly and we appreciate them, uh, you know, kind of coming up with a, a good project here, a good plan. Um, we have an extra access uh, route or exit route uh, off of, uh, off the property onto Southwest Swantown Avenue, which was something that I know that the engineering staff really wanted to get. And then, you know, the uh, active open space areas and the, the dimensional requirements for those um, you know, there was a lot of massaging of the actual project and the, the layout and everything to get those there. So we really appreciate the efforts that were put in by the applicant team on that. Um, as far as the, the you know, the meat, meat and potatoes part of the project, you know, we've gone through and determined uh, that there were a number of uh, uh, permissive variations that were requested for the project. And that's what our PRD process essentially is for. Um, those variations include, um, I'm going to scroll down here, sorry, it's taken a little, a little more time than I thought it would. Um, so it has uh, a number of, of uh, permissive variations. I believe there are 12 of them. And when I get down to it, I will go through them. I'm sorry. This is okay. <laughs> a much longer staff report. Okay. Than all. Sure. Okay. And while, while you're scrolling, just to be clear, so in terms of the term permissive variation, these are not variances. These are as part of the the PRD, the PRD is a sort of more newer modern process as it were. Um, and so there's sort of the zoning overlay, but then when you use the a PRD, it allows for some alterations to the, the requirements of the zoning code. Yes. And that's what we're talking about. Is that a good way of explaining it? Uh, that's exactly right. And I, I, I'm very clear about using the word variations rather than variances yes. because they are distinctly different. Um, so we have a list of, of variations here. Uh, and the, the thing is about the variations is they can be to the underlying zoning and the subdivision code, but they cannot vary from the requirements of the PRD section itself. And so a lot of what they're requesting has to do with the lot sizes and the, the dimensional standards for those lot sizes. Um, we consider the, this project to be a multifamily project because it is multiple units within the same building. However, those units will be on their own lot. And so they have you know, individual lots. You'll notice um, that the uh, preliminary plat uh, does not have specific dimensional uh, dimensions on it because it is you know, kind of up to the civil plan and some of the things that happen when the road is constructed and things like that. The, the final plat will include all that information and staff will ensure that it meets the standards and the intent of what is being uh, reviewed here today. So um, one of the variations is, is from the minimum lot size and I did note uh, in the permissive variations our municipal code has changed to allow for smaller lots since this was applied for. 
However, they would still need to go through the PRD process if they were doing this project, uh, applying for it today, because even uh, with those new standards, um, there are still requirements that they would have to vary from. Um, so they met that standard by having the, uh, the property or the, the buildings uh, vary their setbacks. That will be included as a condition of approval. There's a standard in there that they have to meet uh, requirements uh, A through C or D or E. Um, it's kind of hard to read, but they do meet those standards. Um, the, the second one is to vary from the minimum lot width. Again, because they're requesting smaller lots, uh, these are going to be kind of, you know, dominoes in effect. Uh, third one is uh, minimum lot depth. Fourth is uh, setbacks. Um, so they're requesting a, a rear yard setback of uh, smaller than, than 25 feet. They're going to go down to 20 feet, which is the standard for PRD itself. So they're not asking for any change to the PRD, which is what we require. Um, we uh, have the, we kind of called that one out. We support that request based on the fact that there are significant other, you know, multifamily buildings in the area and much taller and, you know, kind of more of an impact on neighboring properties. We don't feel that this is going to be a negative uh, impact on, on uh, neighboring parcels there. Um, number five, the R4 zone district includes a maximum lot coverage. Obviously, you're going to be quite a bit over 45% with the smaller lots uh, and, and zero setbacks. So that one's in there. Um, the applicant is requesting a variation to the standard that each lot be served by a public street. Um, our engineering department and city engineer worked with the applicant to uh, make sure that their proposed uh, internal driveways and accesses are um, appropriate and safe and will provide the access for our fire trucks and garbage trucks and all that. Um, so we are comfortable with their, their proposed design there. Um, number seven, uh, standards for road design, including cross-section dimensional standards. Again, because they're private streets, they're going to be a little bit different, a little bit narrower. Um, number eight, again, same thing. It's, it's the domino effect when we start reducing minimum lot sizes and changing roads to private. A lot of these standards start moving around a little bit. Um, number nine, the criteria of the subdivision regulations uh, above, and those are the, the dimensional lot standards, are also found in Chapter 21, which is our subdivision standards, so those are variation as well. Um, number 10 is the minimum lot frontage of 30 feet. Uh, some of these units are a little bit smaller than that, so we supported that uh, request as well. And then, again, uh, lots being accessed from the public street, number 11 there. Um, we came up with the... Uh, we can support the request because we can still have public utilities. Um, we have access easements. We have, uh, we don't have a neighboring parcel that they're going to need to extend through. It's not uh, an access to another parcel or anything like that. So we felt that the, the private street system was appropriate in this situation. Um, and finally, number 12 there, uh, limiting the number of homes that can be accessed by a private street. Um, again, uh, after working with the applicant and our engineering department, we were comfortable with providing access to those units off of those private roadways um, because we feel that they are sufficient and uh, appropriate for the, for the site itself. Um, there is also a subdivision waiver that is being requested, and that is um, just uh, the local street standards. Um, it is important to note that the private or the public right of way that they have proposed the extension of Mulberry Place meets the strict st street standards, but their private streets will not. So the public street that's being constructed um, meets all of our standards. That was kind of a, you know, a, a set in stone type situation, but the private roadways will be a, a different uh, standard than what we would have if they were public streets. Sure. And just to uh flesh that out a tiny bit. So the first 12 that you were discussing, those are the sort of alterations, uh, 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 sorry, variations being requested specifically in relation to using the PRD process. And so then the waiver is somewhat different under the code. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. A subdivision waiver can be utilized in a standard uh, subdivision without a PRD or in the PRD process. It's just specifically for chapter 21. And in this case, it's for the street design. And, and it's not the kind of thing that is addressed through a variation request with a PRD. It's something else. Is that Correct. the basic yep. concept? Yep. Okay. So, there you go. So I guess I'm trying to think bigger picture in terms of when I produce my decision, I, 
in my mind, ultimately, then I think there'll be three sort of things I need to address. One is the plat itself, and then the the, or the subdivision request and the waiver of that, the one, sorry, not the waiver of the subdivision request, the one that is specifically a subdivision waiver related to street road standards. So that's sort of one and two. And then the PRD and meeting the criteria and standards for a PRD. And then all those 12 uh, variations would be part of that. Is that is that an accurate assessment of my right. role? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Okay, sorry to interrupt, thank you. No, that's no problem. Um, so we also have, along with the, your uh, PRD request and the preliminary plat, we have a landscape plan, which is approved with as part of this package because the PRD requires landscaping. Um, so the landscape plan uh, is part of that. Uh, we went through and, and did our review and found that they meet the standards there in uh, 1946, which is our landscaping requirements, as well as our design regulations and guidelines document. Um, there is also a land clearing plan, and then uh, the, that will that will be approved as part of it. Um, the other thing about the the PRD is the exterior design and architecture is is also reviewed and approved through this process. So if you want to touch on that in your decision, you can you can do that as well. Those were included as part of the application too. And, and to that end, uh, I tend not to decide more than I need to, uh, just for, you know, purposes of uh, judicial economy and not getting myself in trouble and on what I have expertise in or not. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the landscape plan, I mean, A, do I need to make a decision or, or staff has already made a decision? That was question one. So. Yeah, so on both of those aesthetic considerations, you know, the exterior design and the landscaping, essentially what we're asking for is general conformance with what was submitted. Staff has determined that, that the um, exterior design meets the DRG requirements, the design regulations and guidelines, and then also that the landscaping plan meets the standards that are in our code and the DRG. And so what we're asking for is to have those approved as submitted, and then as they're constructed, we will review for compliance, general compliance with those documents. So that's how it all works. We we have gone through the process of reviewing it against the code to make sure that it meets the standards. And then you can give the thumbs up to that. Got it. Okay. So because it's consolidated review, uh, you know, ultimately you would like a sort of conclusion from me that says, you know, staff did this. They believe that uh, the landscape plan and the design review, as it were, meets the DRG specifications, et cetera. And, you know, hearing examiner concurs or something to that effect, but you would like me to at least weigh in to that extent. Would that be an accurate assessment? Yes, because it's all part of the larger package. It has to get approved all at the same time. So, yeah. Yep. No, I understand. Just wanted to make sure I don't do more than I ought to or leave anything out. Uh, those tend to be of key importance. So. Yep. Okay. And then um, the last item on there is a SEPA checklist. The SEPA checklist um, was reviewed. We issued a determination of non-significance. You don't need to do any further action with that because that's kind of a separate process, but we did want to make sure that that enters the, the, the public uh, record here is that the SEPA was done and uh, we did not find that there would be any significance. Uh, it's the determination of non-significance from that. And so we are moved through that process. We did not get any appeals or comments on it. And uh, so that is is done essentially at this point. Right. So, and I, so the deadline was September 14th, I think, to file an appeal. And that was one of my questions. So no appeals were filed. Uh, and so that is the determination, the final determination and, and stands as is. Essentially. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And so to summarize, um, you know, we went through the process, we reviewed everything, we feel that it meets the standards that we have in our code and our design regulations and guidelines. And so um, essentially the effect of the approval is that uh, the applicant may develop construction plans for their civil uh, improvements, the uh, street right of way, the, the private right of ways, the uh, utilities, all that sort of thing, grading, et cetera. And then those, uh, those improvements won't begin until all of their civil plans, uh, any kind of construction plans are approved 
by city staff, city engineer, et cetera. And so essentially what we're looking for here is a, uh, an approval for the PRD and all the items that kind of go along with that, um, including the preliminary plat, land clearing plan, transportation concurrency, and then again, the aesthetic issues of the landscape plan and the exterior uh, design. And so that is essentially it in a nutshell, and I am certainly available for any questions that might come up. And great. Only Sure. So uh, we talked about SEPA already the, and sort of what role I play in all the various requests. The question, where was it? Oh, you had discussed earlier about the fact that the code, there have been alterations to, I think, the municipal code uh, since this application was deemed complete. And because of PRDs being used, in some respects that ultimately sounds like won't, wouldn't have an impact, but do you, what version of the code ought I to be looking at? Are there vesting concerns? Can you just flesh that out for me, Mr. Lindbergh? So in the long run, nothing changes. Um, essentially what happened is that the changes to the code were in minimum lot size and setback requirements for residential buildings. All of the section numbers are the same. So when you reference those in any kind of writing, it's all the same. Um, if they had applied today under the new code requirements, they still would have had to go through a PRD because they're a little bit smaller than even what the, the minimum lot size requirement is now. Um, generally that, that code change was um, directed towards single family homes. And so it reduced our single family lot size from 7,200 square feet down to 3,200 square feet and the associated uh, setbacks that change with that. So honestly, it, it doesn't matter for your review at all. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. So I just wanted to ensure that I'm not citing wrong sections of the code, but so the code sections all remain the same and the, the aspects that, that were altered uh, in some respect are, are inapplicable here because we're looking at this through the PRD process. Is that that's a good yes. Excellent. Okay. So I think I grasp all that. And then in terms of uh, bigger picture, so the, the city did not receive that I saw any comments from the public in advance of the hearing? No, we did not. Okay. And then no comments from outside agencies, tribal entities, not, no. nothing from nowhere. <laughs> Right. I, it, you know, we, we have a lot of, especially with regards to the state agencies and tribes, we have a lot of protections built into place in our code that handle most of the things that, that those folks would be concerned with. So um, generally, when we go through these projects and these processes, there's not a lot of comment um, from outside agencies. Most of what we have is generally from concerned citizens, and we didn't have any in, that, in this case. So, Okay. And then um, I think I've got information on utilities, stormwater, traffic. The one that sometimes gets overlooked is safe walking routes uh, to school bus stops or schools because we didn't have any specific comments from the school district. Uh, can you provide any additional information just related to schools and how kids would get, get to school, et cetera? Yeah, um, I know I referenced that somewhere in the staff report, so let me see if I can find it real quick. Essentially what's happening there is that, that we can point to the fact that this new public roadway is being built through there as an improvement to what is existing now. And so this project, you know, the, the folks that live in this project will be able to access public roadways via the, the private roadways within the project itself and also this new public road which will connect two fairly significant roadways, Swantown and Fort Nugent, to each other. That, and that's so, what's, sorry, uh, that's the Southwest Mulberry is the extension yes. you're discussing right there. Correct, yeah. And so it will connect these two uh, roads that kind of diverge in angle. And uh, on those two roads are significant, uh, you know, transit opportunities. There's Island Transit that runs uh, buses up and down both of those roadways. Um, the city uh, or the, the school district buses um, they, they park on Fort Nugent just off of uh, Southwest Mulberry Place to stage in the mornings to get their schedules uh, coordinated. Um, so there's, there's plenty of access to transportation and 
Um, and as for schools in particular, I think that uh, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong on this, but I believe that kids in that area are bust. I don't quote me on that for certain, but I believe that is the case. So um, in, in, in answer to your question, we believe it's an improvement because of the, the new accesses that are being provided. We're not changing anything else that would um, degrade anything, uh, but we are in, improving the accesses by uh, increasing the, the interconnectivity of the, the street grid, if you will. Right. And so then on uh, the, the new, what will become public right of way, Mulberry, that will have sidewalks yes. and there are sidewalks existing on uh, Fort Nugent and Swantown such that, you know, if I'm walking to school or, or whatnot, there are sidewalks to walk on for one. And you're confident that if busing would occur, uh, that the infrastructure uh, would allow for appropriate, you know, bus you know, bus turnoffs or, or what or, uh, not uh, to ensure that kids get to school safe. Like I said, that's the one that often gets overlooked in the RCW uh, 5817-110. And I just want to make sure we had touched on that. So, okay. Um, okay. So let me just make sure I've hit all my notes. I believe those were the specific questions I had for city staff. So thank you. Did you have other members of staff you intended on calling on before we hear from the applicant? No, I don't believe so. I did find um, in the in the staff report where we talked about school routes and um, all I all I responded to there, you know, that we have this kind of checklist of responses. It says the proposed project will have interior pedestrian routes that connect to existing pedestrian sidewalks on surrounding neighborhood streets. So got it. Page four, I think. Uh, yes, that is correct. Okay, I did read it. It's just, you know, yeah. some days it's hard to remember everything. Right when you started it, I was like, yeah, okay, it is there, but it's always good to talk about it too. So thank you, uh, yeah. Mr. Lindenberg. Uh, okay, so I think uh, I right before we started, I was told the applicant representative that would sort of be leading the charge is there in the council chambers. So I think we'll go to that person next. Thank you, I'll swear you in. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in testimony you give here today? And if you could just state and spell your name for the recording. Investments, uh, which is kind of the managing um, entity handling this for the development. Okay. Great. Thank you. So this is your opportunity to present any additional information you feel that myself or members of the public should be aware of in advance of my making a decision on the proposal. And then I think I had just a couple questions for your team uh, after you've presented anything you were hoping to present. Uh, no, Your Honor. It's just it's been a lengthy process, but ultimately one that we're grateful for with wonderful staff. I really want to thank Ray and David and everybody, including Your Honor, for being here today to finally allow us to reach this point. Um, there's been excellent efforts made to reduce impacts to the community as well as to create a really high quality product to help the housing affordability issues in the communities in Western Washington. We're really excited to be here. Um, just want to note that our, our civil engineer, Mr. Bill Fortunato is here as well as our architect team, uh, Ming Sing Ting, and then uh, Mark Lamb is counsel and Mr. Brian Franklin, who is actually the president of our company, and him and his father have been working on this project for a very, very long time and very excited to, to be at this moment today. Okay, so as far as I can tell then, everyone involved today, either in the room or virtually, is city staff or part of your team, unless I'm missing something. I believe that's correct, sir. Excellent. Well, A, I do appreciate uh, bringing the team as it were. Sometimes I'll have hearings and the applicant doesn't even show up. And that is a huge frustration because uh, it is the applicant's burden. Uh, and sure, you're aware. Uh, but I, I recognize that this is a uh, more complex uh, proposal uh, than I see sometimes and certainly more more complex than we often see in Oak Harbor. Uh, and and so appreciate that you're available and here for questions and, and uh, just want to make sure we, we get 
the record clear and get everything right. Um, but I, I guess the first question I always like to ask is you had an opportunity to review staff's uh, report in the recommended uh, conditions of approval. Is that right? Yes, sir. And uh, any anything you see in those recommended conditions that that you think could use clarification, or you have any concerns with, or you feel that uh, the applicant would be able to uh, uh, comply with those recommendations? Uh, no, sir. And again, on, on a lot of different things, we kind of rely on our team, as I'm sure you're aware. And I guess most importantly, I haven't heard any objections from our design team. Okay. Um, Sure. I guess I'll ask one clarifying point, uh, which is in terms of uh, impact fees for, for something like traffic, I, I recognize that that the applicant, well, let me make sure I understand. Is the applicant constructing the new public right-of-way or is it dedicating it and the city's constructing it? Applicant is constructing Okay. And so sometimes in those circumstances, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of credit that is, that is granted to an applicant offsetting impact fees for when they pr provide a public service like that. Uh, maybe Mr. Lindenberg can, can hop in for a sec and make sure I'm not speaking at a turn and trying to make sure I didn't miss that. But Mr. Lindenberg, do you, can you weigh in on that real quick? Uh, I'm sorry, what was the, the specific question? Sorry, uh, so impact fees are, are generally collected for, you know, transportation, parks, et cetera, but there are circumstances where a, a significant public benefit is being provided, like the new right-of-way that's being built. Mm -hmm. Does the applicant get credit against their transportation impact fees, or is that a separate process? Uh, that would be a separate process, I believe. Okay. As, uh, yeah, that's that's going to become more in the wheelhouse of our city engineer, and I apologize um, that I don't have the answer for you there. Um, that is something that I believe that we we will work through in the process. Um, there are definitely impact fees, but I, I think that there is an opportunity to to work on that. So um, I, I will leave that to the. I, I think that in, in answer to your question, it's not something that gets solved or approved here in this process. That I understand. I just want to make sure any decision I write doesn't force someone's hand. And I this was fresh in my mind because a, a similar situation came up a few days ago, and the the jurisdiction said, "Oh, you're you know, we didn't mean to imply they don't there's that they're not providing a benefit that ought to be offset or something." So that's all I wanted to say. I, I'll make sure to massage the language, so, you know, were this to be approved, such that there's a, a, a discretion uh, that city staff can work with the applicant to ensure, you know, it's all fair, if that makes sense. Yes. Yeah. Great. Okay. So that was uh, my first question. And then, um, and hop in at any, any point, Mr. Jackson, I'm sorry, I got sidetracked on my notes there. Um, Sure. And then the other thing I was just going to have was, I think you said you have an engineer, one of your engineers here, uh, just a little more on stormwater, uh, just so I get a, a good sense. My sense was stormwater would be sort of collected throughout and channeled to ultimately would be an infiltration vault and then infiltrated on site. But I just want to make sure I didn't misunderstand. And I think some LID features like modular sort of wetlands are going to be used. And I'm getting nods from Bill Fortunato, so maybe I'll yes. swear him in. Bill, are you the person to talk to? <laughs> I am. Okay. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth in testimony you give here today? I do. And if you could just state and spell your name and explain who you are. Sure. My name is Bill Fortunato. That's B-I-L-L-F-O-R-T-U-N-A-T-O. I am a professionally licensed civil engineer in the state of Washington. I'm with a company called Packland Seattle. We're based out of Seattle, Washington. And we are the civil engineer record for the project. Great. Uh, Thank you. Sorry. And uh, so if I was incorrect in my understanding or, or there's nuance that would be helpful, if you, I don't need a full-blown explain everything, <laughs> but the, the, the basics would be good. Yeah, you uh, are very accurate. We will have an infiltration system uh, on site uh, along with treatment that meet the current Department of Ecology standards. Uh, we'll work with city staff to basically, you know, route and design those to the standards. Um, 
and we were going to infiltrate as much of the water on site as possible um, to obviously mitigate any downstream impacts uh, as stated. And we also have a, a, there's an overflow pipe that would connect to the city system as well, but um, that would be only in the, you know, larger event storms that would, would be over and above. Uh, so it's kind of a belt and suspenders kind of thing. Got it. So, and but you're very accurate in what you said. Okay, good. And then when you say the current standards, you know, that's a moving target sometimes. I think I had seen at one point you, the analysis under the 2012 with 2014 DOE manual. I, I know we've got a newer manual, but using LID, you're likely to meet both. But what manual, when I write my decision, are you guys operating under? It is actually going to be the 2019 uh, Department of Ecology. Yeah, so we're, better. we're keeping in line with the current standards. That's wonderful. Okay, great. Thank you for, for clarifying and explaining that. Uh, anything else from an engineering standpoint you wanted to share uh, before we move on? No, I mean, uh, you know, I think Ray had indicated that we worked you know, closely with staff to make sure that the, all the access points uh, worked and uh, they actually, their recommendations provide us, you know, secondary access off the south uh, side of the project. Um, it, it was almost like an aha moment for everybody as soon as they suggested it. So I was actually a little disappointed I didn't think of it, but um, yeah, great job by staff. I really appreciate them. Puzzle pieces came together. Excellent. Um, exactly. Great. Okay. Well, then I, I, I think you've sort of clarified, you know, I, I just like to make sure as it has changed quite a bit in the last few years uh, that my understanding of what's happening with stormwater is accurate less complicated when there are no critical areas on site and we don't have to worry about, you know, hydrologic recharge for wetlands or anything, but uh, infiltration yes, on site clearly is what DOE is hoping for and what you will be doing here and you're using the, the current manual. So that's all the information I was hoping to hear. So thank you very much, Mr. Fortunato. Thank you, sir. Okay. Uh, with that, Mr. Jackson, do you have other members of your team uh, you wanted to call on uh, if they had thoughts they wanted to share? Uh, no, Your Honor, I do not. Unless, you know, obviously, Brian or his father are on and they'd like to say something. But unless you have additional questions, I think probably the rest of the team is fine to allow the proceedings to continue. Uh, sure. Sorry. And you were saying, should I? Should we call on Brian Franklin or not? I, I didn't. That's up to him. Oh, I, I would just say I just want to thank the staff for, for all the work. This has been a long process. Uh, as I'm sure they know, several iterations, but we're we're glad to finally be here and just echo Tim's uh, thankful comments towards all. Sure, you want that in my decision. I'm happy to put you under oath. <laughs> no, no, just a thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Franklin. Uh, okay, and just to verify, we don't have any members of the public that have joined virtually. Uh, does not appear so. I'm hoping Sarah Heller can verify that for me. Yeah, that's correct. No more members have joined the meeting. Excellent. And nobody there in the council chambers uh, from the public has come in? That's correct. Okay. Uh, Ray Lindenberg, any, any thoughts, comments, final things on behalf of the city you wanted to impart before we conclude the hearing today? Um, I don't believe so. Again, uh, it was a, a true collaborative effort. We appreciate the, uh, the efforts of the design team and uh, the, the developer uh, on this has been really uh, easy to work with and we appreciate that. Um, you know, when it, it's one of those things where uh, if we can communicate well and go through the process as it was intended to be, things end up working much better and that definitely happened in this situation. So we do appreciate that as staff. A real love fest. Okay, well, uh, I ultimately uh, do need to, you know, review the materials uh, closely uh, to produce my decision, you know, my sort of initial thought based on everything I've seen and heard today is I don't, I don't see any uh, major red flags or issues that would dictate a different result. So my intent is in the next couple of weeks uh, to put together my decision on the, on the many things I'm being asked to decide, uh, it turns out, but the, at base, the preliminary plot and PRD uh, and w the plan would be to issue a decision approving that with uh, the recommendations that staff has provided. I always like to, you know, make sure I, I point out that, you know, I have the prerogative to change my mind or uh, alter the conditions if I, if I 
deem that appropriate. And sometimes I'll tweak language uh, to make sure I feel like, you know, everything is as clear as possible. Uh, so that will be my intent uh, here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and then once my uh, decision is produced, that'll go to uh, Sarah Heller and she'll make sure that the applicant team and, and everybody else, any parties of record, et cetera, uh, I'll, I'll receive it. So uh, with that, I think we can conclude our hearing today. Uh, thank you uh, to staff uh, and the applicant team, uh, nobody from the public. So uh, thank you all for being here, being available uh, to answer my questions and participate in the process. And I wish you all uh, a happy fall. I, we're in fall now and uh, enjoy the nice fall weather until the miserable winter comes. With <laughs> that, we'll, we'll end our hearing today. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.